Okay, thanks so much, Dominic. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about here is basically taken from a chapter in this book, which there'll be a couple of presentations today <laughs> drawing on because my esteemed colleague, Christina Richards, is also here. Um, and we, we wrote this book as a practical guide, really, for practitioners on uh, gender and sexual diversity. So it covers many of the um, topics we're, we're talking about today. Um, but I'm going to do a kind of overview around non-monogamies. And as Dominic says, you know, that it is a lot of nons. And that is one area of, of interest with this is that um, do we define these things as non-monogamies as against the kind of mainstream or do we use other words to describe them? I've used non-monogamies because I guess it's the best overall umbrella that we have in terms of a, a term for open non-monogamies. You'll see there's lots of other words, but none of them really work quite as such a broad umbrella. So that's why I'm using it today. Um, so the first point to make before we get into it is that... Um, I'm going to be focusing on the current common kinds of Western non-monogamous relationships or open non-monogamous relationships that exist. But it's important to remember that this stuff's relevant to pretty much all the clients that you'll see. Um, one, one issue is that um, up to some studies estimate about two thirds of, of people who are in so-called monogamous relationships at some point are secretly non-monogamous in the, in the way of affairs or infidelities and cheating. I'm not going to be talking about those things today, but obviously a lot of what I'm talking about is relevant to them too. Um, anthropologists have started to really question this distinction between monogamy and non-monogamy, finding that you know, some supposedly monogamous relationships are actually more open than some non-monogamous relationships. People are having the same kinds of conversations within monogamous and non-monogamous relationships. So there's, there's kind of slippage there. And also we've got to remember that globally more countries are non-monogamous than are monogamous, mostly in the form of polygamy. So in terms of working in multicultural setups, you're going to come across people who've got non-monogamous backgrounds at least, or the communities they come from um, are non-monogamous. So... A decade ago, back in 2005, when I was first presenting on this topic, um, and it is, it is a decade since I did those early presentations now, um, I made this slide to illustrate the different forms of non-monogamy. Um, so we've got on here, these were the sort of common forms that we identified at that time, and they were the ones that Darren Langridge and I discussed in our book, Understanding Non-Monogamous. We kind of divided the book into these three. Um, so there were swinging and open relationships, and both of those were kind of about people generally being in, in um, emotionally close couples, but having sex with other people. Um, swinging more common within heterosexual communities, some bisexual women, um, and uh, often about sort of swinging clubs, swinging parties, also dogging if people have come across that, so people kind of meeting in public spaces for sex. Also quite a lot of websites for singles meeting couples and couples meeting singles in order to have sex. But the, the, the generally the, the emotional sort of love relationship being between a couple. And then open relationships, the stats were saying about 50% of gay men particularly were in open relationships. And again, that was usually the form of a couple, wanting, wanting a couple relationship for the emotional love relationship, but being open to sexual contact, often casual sexual encounters. Um, sometimes the, uh, with swinging and open relationships, sometimes the couple doing that together, sometimes them doing it separately. Um, and then there was polyamory, which was what I was researching um, at that point, which is the kind of belief that it's acceptable or ideal to have more than one love relationship at the same time. So it differs from, from the other two in that way. The emphasis is on multiple emotionally close or love relationships, whereas the other two are more about um, having more than one sexual relationship, but generally only one love relationship. So that was 2005. This is 2015. <laughs> We've come a long way. Um, <laughs> so really, there's been a massive proliferation of forms of open non-monogamy. And does, it, it, this is something we've seen in many sexual identity groups, many gender identity groups, um, the proliferation of terminologies, uh, ways of understanding these things. So I just want to mention a few of these to you. Um, so we've got monogamish at the top. This was Dan Savage's term. Um, for relationships that were somewhat open. Um, there's also the new monogamy on there is another term that's been used for, for somewhat open um, mon monogamous relationships. Um, there's also fuck buddies, hookup culture, friends with benefits. Um, 
obviously, some, many of these things existed before, but they've certainly made their way further into the mainstream um, over the last decade um, and with more people kind of adhering to them. So, so all of those things are various ways of people having sexual relationships outside of a conventional couple model, sex with friends or hooking up for a one night stand. Um, then we've got polyfidelity on there, which is where more than two people form a relationship, but then that's closed to anybody else. So it's fidelitous within the three people or four or five people. Um, what else we got on there? Solo poly. Um, that's the one with, with the Bill and Ted be excellent to each other, illustrating it from the Facebook group for solo poly. And that's where the, the model is more based on an individual having many partners of emotional or, or, or sexual closeness. Um, but but sort of the, the single unit being the kind of the main unit. Um, monopoly there, there's, there's a lot of stuff about people where the two people or more in a relationship have different models. So a monogamous person in relationship with a polyamorous person, for example. And then we have relationship anarchy, which I'll say a little bit more about in a moment, which is versions of non-monogamy that question really the whole distinction between different kinds of relationships, for example, between partners and friends, and start to question particularly why certain relationships are often prioritized or privileged over others. So yeah, lots of different, lots of different forms of open non-monogamy existing and becoming, people becoming more aware of them in the media, I think. So <laughs> I'm not gonna go into all of this, but this is a rather wonderful diagram uh, by the writer Franklin Vo, who writes a lot of really good blogs on this topic. I think I can go in a, a little bit closer. Um, and Franklin Vo and Eve Rickett have recently published a, a book called More Than Two, uh, which is an excellent sort of self-help guide um, to, to, for, for openly non-monogamous people. It's, again, it's really telling how far we've come in a decade. It's so different to the books that were being published 10 years ago in terms of the depth and the, the usefulness of the kind of advice that's in there. You really get the sense of people having walked the walk and really sharing their expertise and experience in that book. Um, so Franklin came up with this image of all of the different forms of um, non-monogamy that he was aware of, including both secret non-monogamy and open non-monogamy. But it's just really to make the point of how even in one group, even within their uh, open relationships or polyamorous relationships or swinging, again, there are multiple other, there's multiple forms within even each of those words. So there's a real diversity going on here. And there's also a lot of overlap between the different forms as well. You can see that they kind of overlap. And if you, if you want to look at it online, you can read all the little quotes around the outside that kind of give examples, really, of little quotes from people who adhere to those different forms of non-monogamy. But this... Um, this drawing is one that I'm finding a, a particularly helpful in my work at the moment. So this is a cartoon... And it's by Kirsten Rower. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and, and Kirsten was trying to tease out, again, different forms of non-monogamy. And I, I'll go through this one in a little more detail. So, so it starts off with um, idealized monoamory, as, as Kirsten calls it. Uh, so it's got this little character saying, I'm feeling love for both Alex and Kim. What am I going to do about it? Um, monogamy, choosing one and not the other to have the relationship with. Um, and then you get the next row, which is things that are sort of versions of having an additional sexual relationship that isn't a, an emotionally close or love relationship. So you've got cheating of having an affair. Then there's don't ask, don't tell models, which are about whether, whether, whether the couple are kind of aware that they are going to do things with other people, but they're not going to say anything about it. Don't ask, don't tell. Um, then you've got open relationships where they are aware that something is going on and what it is as well. Um, but it's, a, as we said, a sexual, usually, relationship rather than emotionally close. So that's that second line. Then the third line there is kind of versions of somewhat closed polyamory or somewhat rule-based kind of polyamory. So obviously we've got uh, polygamy in there, sort of multiple marriages, albeit that those generally aren't recognized within Western countries um, legally. Uh, then we have polyfidelity, which I mentioned before, and then hierarchical polyamory. So that's the kind of primaries and secondaries kind of model where there's a, a primary partnership and then other emotionally close or love relationships but that, that are considered somewhat secondary to that primary couple partnership usually. Um, 
And then the third, the, or the final line, the fourth line, is versions of more open or less hierarchical open non-monogamy. And I think this is where it gets really useful. We start to see you know, these being teased apart a bit more, whereas before they might have been kind of clumped together. So egalitarian polyamory differs from the hierarchical kind in that there's a real sense of trying to um, have the idea that all of those relationships are equally important or equally close um, or equally valued. Um, then you've got solo polyamory, which again was mentioned earlier about where the sort of main unit is the self, is the individual, um, and there's a real awareness that they need kind of to, to have that some autonomy and space around that individual. And then relationship anarchy, and you can see that model there of the person having multiple relationships and not really distinguishing whether they're sexual or not, or partners or friends or, or what kind of relationship they are. So I, I think you might find with clients who are exploring this, this, this kind of thing is quite useful to help them locate themselves and also really useful if they're having conversations in their relationships to find out where are they and where are other people. Because tensions can often happen if people think they're talking about the same thing, open relationships or polyamory, and actually they're not. The important thing to say at this point, though, um, which we make very clear in the book, is as with everything you're going to be hearing about today, um, majority of the clients that, you're, that you'd see who are openly non-monogamous, it would be nothing to do with their presenting issue. You know? So it wouldn't be about thinking we need to explore this. You know, that they're openly non-monogamous, they're fine with that, it's got nothing to do with the bereavement they've just been through or, or whatever else. Um, so it's obviously worth knowing enough about it that you can understand their worlds and the people they're talking about and you know what they mean if they talk about multiple partners, for example, but you know, not something you necessarily need to explore in depth. Some people might be coming because they're at the point of maybe opening up their relationship or trying to think through these things. And then, you, then basically some of these ideas I'm just going to now give you quickly might be helpful things to, to work with and also as might be using one of those models and helping people to locate themselves. So this is the one I find really helpful that like I use a lot in trainings. Um, and again, it's really helpful for everybody, actually, because it's not about open non-monogamy. It's just about where you locate yourself on certain continua. I find that most people tend to separate out these two lines of emotional closeness on the one hand and sexual or physical contact on the other. Not everybody does. For some, those are completely interlinked. For others, these continuums wouldn't be relevant to their relationships. But I think within our culture, the majority of people do seem to to understand it on these kind of continuums. Um, and you might want to think about it yourself as I'm talking through it. So thinking about, you know, where are you on a scale of emotional closeness from wanting one emotionally close relationship in your life that's like the main relationship you have maybe with a partner through to wanting multiple close relationships that you'd see on, on a pretty similar level. Um, so obviously people at the far monoamory kind of end, it's about maybe having a partner who they see as a soulmate, you know, their one true love, the, their best friend, maybe the only person they let in close. And then moving along the continuum, you know, having other friends and family who are important, maybe staying close with ex-partners. That's often a sort of tension that different people have different views on in the relationship. Um, is it okay to stay up all night talking with somebody you've just met? Um, and at the far end, deliberately building networks of communities of equally important or valued people. And that might be about who you choose to live with or go on holiday with or share finances with or, or more to do with, you know, who do you let in? Who can you be vulnerable with? Um, how much time you spend with people, etc. On the sex continuum, so at one end, you know, only being able to have sex or even physical contact at all with, uh, with one person. Um, sometimes gender rules come into both of these continuums as well, that it's okay to be maybe a bit tactile with people of the gender that your partner isn't, but gen the same gender as your partner is seen as more threatening um, for some people. And then moving along that continuum, I don't know if people have come across the list of five that some monogamous people have. It's an interesting one. Um, some people have a list of five kind of celebrities that if they ever actually bumped into them <laughs> and the celebrity was interested in them, then, yeah, they'd be allowed to go and have sex with that person. <laughs> Johnny Depp features on many, <laughs> I think, in that kind of person. Um, moving along a bit, maybe it being okay to flirt with other people as long as it's not serious, being okay to fantasize about other people. Um, 
is online pornography okay um, to look at? Is cyber sex okay? There's you know many con tensions around that stuff at the moment about what online sex and online pornography, how those feature in people's lives. Um, and then to you know maybe I think that uh, Franklin Vogue calls it the hundred mile rule that if you're more than hundred miles away from each other, it's pretty much okay to do whatever you want at a conference or something. Um, <laughs> um, and then. And then at the far end, you know, everyone's free to make their decisions about whether a relationship's going to be sexual or not sexual, and that's, that's not important. So, that's, so that model might be helpful for you. Um, another thing to mention that folk do is around contracts and self-disclosure. You could see both of these on a continuum as well, really. Um, so again, it's a sort of where that hierarchical versus egalitarian poly comes in, that some people are more at the end if they want a defined contract, they won't know exactly what is going to be okay and isn't going to be okay from the start. Other people want a model that's much more about ongoing communication, negotiation, flexibility. And freedom and safety often come in here. So some people feel more free and more, and more safe with more of a contract and more of a sort of something set down. And other people feel more free and more safe uh, if there's more flexibility. So you might well find that you're discussing this kind of thing with clients and especially where there's a difference in terms of what would make them feel more safe um, in the relationship. Um, and there's a number of research papers on this of the kind of restrictions that some people have who prefer the contract model. So it's often about certain forms of sex only in the primary couple, for example, or don't have anyone else staying over, or sometimes a primary partner having vetoes over who, the, who their partners can have relationships with or not. Um, and then disclosure is more about... Um, uh, from a on a continuum from the kind of don't ask, don't tell arrangement to the kind of tell me everything arrangement um, where people really want to know all the details and different people, again, might have different priorities. Um, and important to point out here, and Franklin and Eve go into this into a lot more detail, uh, it's very easy for people to prioritise a, a somewhat primary relationship and actually treat other people quite unethical, unethically. And I've been writing quite a bit about Sartre and de Beauvoir's relationship, and this was something that she really acknowledged towards the end of their life, was they treated each other pretty well, but the other people were a bit objectified and not really given the same rights to privacy, for example. You know, if you've got that, you have to tell me everything about what you do with other people rule. Well, what about the other people? So that kind of stuff's worth teasing out. I've just quickly put on here the relationship anarchy ideas, which is much more about, I suppose, I won't go through them all, but this idea of... Uh, love and respect instead of entitlement. So it would be away from those ideas of contracts or um, you know rules about self-disclosure. Not people not feeling entitled to another person's time or privacy or so on. Again, that's available online if you want to have a look through in a bit more detail. Um, so just to the last slide, the, the biggest problem probably that non-monogamous, openly non-monogamous people face is what they call mononormativity, which is like heteronormativity, mononormativity, the assumption that it's natural and normal to be monogamous. Um, and I quite like this little slide, which kind of captures it quite well in terms of, you know, what we live in a, a, a mononormative world, so what are the assumptions that are made about open non-monogamy or polyamory? And so, you know, yeah, people think that it's about wife swapping or cheating or polygamy or having a massive orgy. Um, but, the, but the polyamorous people themselves think it's all about activism marching. What it's actually about is time management. <laughs> That's pretty much what comes up every time you talk to non-monogamous people. Um, so, yeah, remembering that the issues around coming out or remaining closeted may be vexed ones. Um, so... Uh, Obviously, we have this idea that coming out is better for people's mental health, but we live in quite a precarious situation in terms of this. There's no legal recognition or protection, um, so people may decide that it's safer to remain closeted. And certainly, I've heard some quite horror stories about people having social services called in because people are worried about their kids, etc. In a way, we're in that place we were with same-gender relationships 10, 20 years ago. We're just beginning to get the research that says, actually, kids who grow up in poly households do great. Um, Elizabeth Sheff in the States is doing some wonderful work on that. But, you know, for, for people living their everyday lives, that they may feel it's safer not to be out. And if they are out, they may face alienation, rejection, and also pressure to be the poster child. Again, a lot of us are familiar with that idea that if we are out, then we've got to be perfect at it. Um, there's often assumptions made, you know, people are given plus one invitations. That it's assumed that a breakup won't be as painful if you're poly because you've got other partners, that kind of problem. 
Um, second biggest problem poly people face is polynormativity, which is that thing of, you know, once you're outside the mainstream, you often get a whole load of rigid rules within communities about, you know, how to be properly gay or queer or poly. Um, so, yeah, some of these are... Um, the search for the poly grail, I invented that, so I'm going to put it in. <laughs> so the idea that, you know, you stop looking for your one true love in monogamy, but now you're looking for the one true way of doing relationships. And if you find that, you know, all relationships are going to be safe and secure and not have all the pain that relationships inevitably do have. Um, also, polysaturation is a thing. That's sort of thinking, well, I must just keep having more and more partners and then I've got no time to look after myself or anyone else. I can't think of people who would do these things, but, you know, apparently, apparently some people do, do have these problems. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, I like this T-shirt. So there's a lot of uh, creativity and fun around language within poly as well. Polyamory is wrong. It's either multiamory or polyphilia, but mixing Greek and Latin roots, wrong. <laughs> but, you know, it's worth asking people, clients, about the, like, the language they use. So things like metamor being a word for your partner's other partner, which is a lot more positive than mistress, for example, um, or different words for emotions that have inv been invented, like compersion as the opposite of jealousy, positive feeling on seeing your partner with another partner. And in Britain, people have used the word fribbly for the same thing, which I'm quite glad to have been part of getting that word out there more widely, fribbly. Yeah, use it today. <laughs> okay, so in conclusion, I think I'm just about right for time. Uh, these are some of the good practice things that Christina and I pulled out, very similar, obviously, for a lot of the other things we're covering today. But the importance of reflexing, uh, reflexively engaging with your own assumptions about monogamy, non-monogamy, and encouraging the people you work with to do the same. <coughs> Being aware of the big umbrella, you know, all different ways of doing non-monogamy, all different reasons that people end up with it. Don't assume it's the same for everybody. Uh, don't assume it will be an issue for all non-monogamous clients. Um, if necessary, help people to access support and resources. There's loads of stuff online. There's loads of good books now. Um, exploring what clients would like themselves rather than assuming, for example, that they'd want a contract or that they wouldn't want a contract. Encouraging open negotiation and communication and normalizing non-monogamy. Again, media has improved drastically in the last 10 years. There's now pretty good articles about, um, you know, folk who do this kind of thing. So it's good to point people to sort of role models. And here's just a few books. Um, so obviously, Christina and my book has, is good for practitioners. But if you're looking for self-help books, uh, the Rewriting the Rules book that I did is, covers kind of monogamy and non-monogamy. But more than two, Opening Up and The Ethical Slut are three really good books for clients who are looking to explore this stuff in more depth. They're, they're all really, really good kind of opening books on this topic. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions or comments? Yay. Yeah. Would you like to crystal ball games and imagine uh, how long it will be before we can present that kind of imbalance and, and helpful material in a school context? <laughs> it's an excellent question I mean I can't help thinking of my utopia you know I mean I think that the issues of consent people are talking a lot at the moment about teaching consent in school and consent and is at the heart of a lot of these kind of relationship structures and also a lot of the, the kink communities that DK is going to be talking about I think it'd be brilliant to bring those ideas into schools and we don't you know we don't have to talk about them in a sexual context it's just really useful to get kids thinking about this in all their relationships so in a way the relationship anarchy stuff is very useful for breaking down that boundary of why do we think about some things in romantic relationships that we don't think about in relation to friendships etc when when and if this will actually happen it's so hard to you know you, you see things moving forward but also then going backwards at the same time it's very very difficult to to crystal ball gaze but thanks for a good question <laughs> Yeah, the, the question is about whether, as therapists, we collude with, with mononormativity or heteronormativity by perhaps not flagging up our own identities and practices where they're different for this. Or, you know, the term couple therapy is one I hate. Um, you know, relationship therapy is so much more open. So it's about thinking about language. So I'm just, I've just been writing up a, um, a study that a, a colleague of mine did on long-term relationships. And just thinking all the way through writing that is sort of like a self-help book. Like, what can I use in terms of words that don't imply always a couple model or a monogamous model. So using words like, you know, a partner might do this. It leaves it open that you might have more than one partner, you know. Um, so I think, yeah, thinking a lot about the wording on, on websites is a great idea. Um, 
You know, the outness self-disclosure stuff with, with, with clients is a, is a tricky one, but you, we, it is worth continuing to be aware of the fact that, you know, people who fit the supposed norm and really isn't a norm when it comes to monogamy, because we know most people are non-monogamous in some way, but, you know, that they don't have to flag these things up, whereas we generally have to do something to show that we're not that. Yeah, thank you. So the point is about relationship as a verb, um, and I think that's why I think thinking of relationships as something we do rather than something that we have. Yeah. It's a very helpful thing to, to bring in. Um, and again, with this book I'm writing at the moment, it's, you know, when you talk to people about their everyday relationships, it is a matter of, of doing. It's little acts. You know, the, one of the examples from a non-monogamous um, triad who were, in that, who were in that study were about the importance of the mugs that they used for cups of tea. They had little <laughs> rituals about, you know, who shared which mugs. And it was beautiful, you know, and another, another triad had, you know, again, rituals about the morning and how they, you know, who slept with whom and how they managed the, the getting up period. And, you know, it, it's all about how they do it. It's not about, you know, oh, I have this relationship with so-and-so static. It's like it's an ongoing doing process. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're right, and I think that's something that you know I just didn't have time to go into enough. But there's some really good writing about jealousy, for example, and and the opposite of jealousy, um, and those feelings, and you know that we can't deny how those flow in and out during and fantasies, and fantasies exactly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.